God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. So glad you came to worship with us. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about what to do when a river runs through. What to do when a river runs through. Joshua chapter 3. Uh, while you find your way there, I uh, just want to wish all of you a very blessed, joyful Thanksgiving as you gather Thursday with family, with loved ones, with friends around your tables, uh, and just pray that it's a joyful time for you. Uh, my mom is turning 80 over Thanksgiving weekend, and so uh, we're looking forward to being together celebrating uh, her birthday. And uh, Thanksgiving Eve, Eve, Tuesday evening, we'll be here at 7, my favorite service of the whole year, because you do the preaching, and uh, come share a testimony of the Lord's done something good for you this year. We want you to come tell us about it. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 3, going to begin reading in verse 1. Let's talk about what to do when a river runs through. Joshua 3, beginning in 1. The Bible says, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you haven't been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of the Jordan's river waters, go stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and the Socialites. Those are the residents of Greenwich. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went on ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest time. I like that. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a great heap a distance away at a town called Adam, <coughs> excuse me, in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah was completely cut off. Excuse me for one moment. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just getting over a little throat thing here, so you'll have to bear with me. They put up with me in first and second, so you have to put up with me in third, all right? We'll be all right. <clears throat> so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation completed the crossing on dry ground. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and your powerful word. Father, I pray that we would encounter you as the word is ministered and that each one would hear a word from heaven. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen? Why does God work in the mysterious ways that he does? Whenever I read the miracle stories of the Old Testament, I have to be honest with you, it brings some troubling questions to my mind. 
Why does God lead his people into impossible situations? Why does he lead his people into moments when we're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea? Why does he lead his people into situations where we must have a miracle in order to survive? Why does he lead to the shores of the Red Sea with the Egyptian army nipping at our heels? Why does he lead to an oasis of bitter water? Why does he lead to a book a brook called Cherith and then the brook dries up? Why does he lead to a Gentile widow's house for food only to discover that she's on her last meal? Why does he summon onto the Sea of Galilee when there's a storm on the horizon? Why does he lead to the banks of Jordan when it's flooded? Why does God do the things he does the way that he does? Right now we're looking at stories of faith. We're looking at some of the heroes of the Bible and we're considering defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them? What encouragement can we draw from them? You see, as a church family, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. We're just five weeks away from holding our first worship services in our new sanctuary on Christmas Eve. The sanctuary won't be completely finished yet, but it will be together enough that we can worship inside. It's especially meaningful because Harvest Time's very first service was on Christmas Eve, 1983. There were just six people there. How awesome this Christmas Eve to move into our new 1,000-seat sanctuary. But we have a challenge in front of us right now. We are in urgent need of about $250,000 to finish the sanctuary enough to get a, a temporary certificate of occupancy. We need even more than that to finish the lower level, but our goal right now is to try to finish the sanctuary, move into it. We'll keep working on the downstairs after that. So right now we're asking everyone in our church family to stand with us in prayer and in sacrificial giving and in faith. We have come to the banks of the Jordan and it's flooded. In Joshua chapter 3, we find that the children of Israel had a big problem. Their big moment had finally come. After 40 years of walking in the wilderness, it was finally time for them to go into the promised land. Everything they had been waiting for, everything they had been hoping for and believing for, it was now so close that they could see it. They could smell the nectar and honey wafting across the Jordan River from the Promised Land. They could practically taste the grapes of Eskel. But there was one itsy-bitsy little problem. There was a raging river standing between them and the Promised Land. Jordan was flooded. There was a physical barrier preventing them from moving forward. And not only was there a physical barrier, but I find there were psychological barriers as well. You know, this whole thing, it just really didn't feel right. The leader wasn't right. He was new and untested. He was no Moses. The timing wasn't right. It was flood season, not the time for crossing rivers. The place wasn't right. They were crossing straight across from Jericho, the most fortified city in the promised land. The plan wasn't right. Just walk right into a swollen river. There was a psychological barrier of fear. There was a psychological barrier of frustration. This guy leading us, he's incompetent. He doesn't know what he's doing. I've learned that a lot of time in life, the psychological barriers that we face are a lot bigger problem than the physical barriers because they rob us of faith. And when we have an impossible situation, the answer does not lie in the physical realm. It lies in the realm of faith. What to do when a river runs through? What do you do when a river stands between you and your dreams? 
when there's a physical barrier preventing you from accomplishing your goal, when there's a psychological barrier standing between you and peace, what do you do when a river stands between you and the promises of God? Looking at Joshua chapter 3, I, I see three things to do when a river runs through, and I want to share them with you quickly on this Sunday afternoon. What to do when a river runs through? Three things from Joshua 3. First of all, when a river runs through, follow God on the ground. Follow God on the ground. But, but I want someone to hear me this morning. Sometimes God has to take away something precious from us in order to prepare us to receive what he has for us next. That was certainly the case for the children of Israel on the banks of Jordan. For 40 years, God led them through the wilderness with a pillar of fire by day and a cloud by night. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus revealed that he was the pillar of fire in the wilderness. He was the cloud. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. But if you think about it, what a wonderful, caring God that we have. That cloud provided air conditioning by day in the desert, and it provided heat, and it provided a soothing night light at night. Not only did that pillar and that cloud provide them with creature comfort, but imagine how reassuring it was to them. Predatory animals would have been kept at bay by the fire at night. If an army thought about uh, ambushing them, they couldn't do it because of the firelight that surrounded them by night. Now on the banks of the Jordan, the pillar and the cloud are taken away from them. And they're replaced by a small golden box carried on two long poles. The Ark of the Covenant is mentioned 15 times in the crossing of Jordan. It is the symbol that's central to this miracle. Beloved, I feel like the, word, the Lord has a word for somebody. Perhaps something precious has been taken away from you recently. Maybe you've lost someone or something that was a great source of comfort and security to you. I feel like the Lord is saying to you, don't be overwhelmed and don't be afraid. That was removed in order for God to bring you to what is next. Trust God. On the banks of the Jordan, the symbol of God's presence with his people changes from fire in the sky to a box on the ground. It's a sign that God is doing new things. He's moving in new ways. God in the sky is now God on the ground. What does that mean? Well, God on the ground means that God is with me personally. God in the sky meant God before me, it meant God behind me, it meant God beside me, it meant God above me, it meant God all around me, but it also meant God beyond me. Remember, only Moses talked to God face to face. Only Moses breathed the rarefied air of Mount Sinai, but on the banks of Jordan, God was doing something new. God on the ground is God in the midst of all of his people. God on the ground is God in the hands of all of his people. God is not distant and detached. He's not aloof. He is not beyond our reach. He is God with us. He is a very present help in time of trouble, close to the brokenhearted, near to us. God on the ground means he's with me very personally. And God on the ground means that he wants to work through me. There are many similarities between the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus and the crossing of the Jordan in the book of Joshua. In fact, the narrative is written in such a way that, that the two events mirror each other almost perfectly. But there's one major difference during the time of Moses, God in the sky was about what God did through the leadership of just one. God used Moses 
alone to split the Red Sea. David wrote the children of Israel saw the miracles, but God used Moses to do it. They were spectators. He was the instrument. But in Joshua, God on the ground is about what God can do through the partnership of many. It took the participation of the whole community to cross the Jordan. It took the faith of every Israelite. It took the obedience of every Israelite. It's true, Joshua was the set man. He heard the word from the Lord, but it was the people who carried God's presence into the river. God on the ground means this time it's personal. It means that you carry the presence of God inside of you. God talks to you and God talks through you. It means that you are God's partner in bringing miracles for the community. With Moses, it was stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. But now with Joshua, it's when you see the ark, you move with it. Follow it. While I was praying over these scriptures this week, I, I heard two words from the Lord regarding phase two. The first word is, please, don't be a spectator. I really believe that that someone has said to themselves, you know, I think I'm going to sit this one out. Maybe you've said it subconsciously. Maybe, I really believe someone has used those literal words with regard to phase two, I'm going to sit this one out. Maybe you've given to other building projects here or, or somewhere else at another church and you feel like you've done enough. I plead with you from the Lord, don't take that attitude. Don't be a spectator. The second word is, please don't say, my job is done until this whole job is done. The tribes of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh asked the Lord for permission to settle on the east side of the Jordan River. And God said to them, that's fine, you can do that. But listen, your job isn't done until the whole job is done. When Israel crossed Jordan, God made Reuben and Gad and Manasseh go first ahead of everybody else dressed for battle just in case the arrows started flying from Jericho. They'd be the first ones to receive them. Beloved, I know that you have given and given and given until it hurts, but please don't give up now on the banks of the Jordan until this job is done. Please don't take the attitude, I've done my part. I'm not doing any more. Aren't you so glad that God doesn't take that attitude with us? I already helped him. I'm not helping him anymore. I beg of you today, don't be a spectator. And don't say, my job is done until the job is done. Do you know, if everyone would give something right now, that would be enough to get us to a temporary certificate of occupancy on our new sanctuary. If 250 individuals would give $1,000 each, we could finish the sanctuary enough to get a TCO. Denise and I have already given $1,000 cash each. My father-in-law was here last week from Canada. He gave $1,000. My mom gave $1,000. So that's four. So that's just 246 now that we need. Not everyone can give that much, but you know some can do more. But if everyone would do something before Christmas, we could get across this river. Would you pray? Here's what I want to ask you to do. Would you pray? Honestly, test God and see. Ask him to put something in your hands specifically to give to this building. And watch what God does in the month of December. God on the ground. It means God is with me personally. It means that God wants to use me. And God on the ground means that God is guiding me from victory to certain victory. Why does God do the things he does? Why does he lead us to Jordan when it's flooded? Why does he put us in a position where we must have a miracle? Why all the drama? Well, in, in verse 10 of Joshua 3... 
God gives us the explicit reason. Joshua says God is doing all of this so that you will know that the living God is with you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and all the rest. You see, God brought Israel to the banks of the Jordan at flood time so that they would know that they were not just some people crossing a river, but they were God's people being led by him over that river and led from victory to victory to victory. You see, God brought Israel to Jordan at flood time because after Jordan, there was a walled city called Jericho. And after Jericho, there was a whole land full of giants that needed to be subdued. And so God's people needed to know that he was with them so they'd keep stepping forward in faith and stepping forward in faith and stepping forward in faith. How do I know that God is with me? And that he will certainly lead me from victory to victory. It's because I have been to the banks of Jordan before. And every time I've been there, my God has shown up with a miracle. I was home alone with my dad one night when I was in junior high school. And he collapsed on his bed and started having a heart attack started calling my name. I I was on a different floor of the house. His bedroom was on the first floor. I was up on the second floor. I I didn't hear his voice calling me, but I went into his bedroom, and there he was lying on the bed, rolling and grabbing his chest. And I dropped to my knees, and I literally screamed the name of Jesus. And when I said the name of Jesus, his heart attack stopped instantly, and he got up off of his bed. On the night before I left for my senior year of Bible college, I didn't have a penny to pay for school. And a man from my church, whom I'd never really spoken to personally, gave me a check to pay for my entire senior year of college. And there was even a little leftover to buy some pizza. When I arrived at seminary in Springfield, Missouri, I had no groceries, I had no money for groceries, and I had no job. And a woman from Philadelphia knocked on my door with 30-something bags of groceries that she started bringing in so much food I had to give it away. Two days later, I was the first student ever hired to a full-time job at the seminary, and they really didn't know what to do for me. So on top of my salary, they gave me a scholarship that paid for my entire Master of Divinity degree. When Denise and I couldn't conceive, they told us that I'd have to administer daily hormone shots to her. And I didn't want to do it. I don't mind taking a needle anytime. It doesn't really bother me, but it skeeves me to give someone else a needle cried out to the Lord, and on the day that we were supposed to begin the hormone therapy, we found out that she was carrying twins. God gave us double for our trouble. On New Year's Eve 2003, we were home sick. Our twins were one year old, and all four of us were sick as dogs. Walt Jamroga had to do the, Pastor Nick was on the piano, and Walt Jamroga had to preach the New Year's Eve service that night, Denise was lying on our living room sofa, sacked out with one sick twin, and I was on a sleeping bag on the living room floor with the other sick twin. You've never, we have been vomited on in stereo, all right? We've never, uh, you know, the twin thing, we've, 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 literally, they used to vomit on us in stereo. And I'm lying there on the living room floor, and I began crying out to the Lord. We hadn't been able to make our giving pledge to this building. Denise was working full-time Right up until the time that she went in labor with the twins, she went into early labor, and so that was it. We lost one full-time salary, and I I didn't get a pay raise for three years in a row here because of the demands of this building on the church budget. There was no money to give any of us increases. And I began to cry out to the Lord, and I said, Lord, we haven't made our pledge. We really want to do our part. We want to give what we said we would give. Three weeks after I prayed that prayer, we got a call out of the blue from Western Canada. Denise's aunts and uncles decided to sell their family farm in Alberta, and they decided to give Denise's mother's share to Denise. Denise's mom had passed away years earlier. 
And the amount that they wired to us was the exact amount that we had pledged to give to this building. They told me in 2016 that my heart would never recover from congestive heart failure. I had committed to go to India and Nepal to preach, so I went and preached, and my friends there prayed for me. And when I came home, they looked at my heart again, and they found that it's 100% whole. Do I wish I had to stand on the banks of Jordan? No, I do not. You know, sometimes I've met people who have been through horrible things and, and they say, I would go through it all over again to learn what I learned. I don't feel that way. <laughs> Do I wish I had to go through Jordan? No, I didn't wish I had to go through it. Phase one was so hard. I said, Lord, I never want to do it again, and here we are. But here's what I have learned on the banks of Jordan. I am not just some middle-aged white guy trying to find his way in the world. I am a son of the Most High God being led by his hand from victory to certain victory. Beloved, you listen to me. Somebody take faith this morning. You are not just anybody trying to make your way in the world. You are a son of the Most High God. You are a daughter of the Most High God. You are being led by His hand, and He will lead you certainly from victory to victory. And listen to me, we're not just some group trying to move into a new building. We are God's people and we are on a spiritual journey being led by Him from victory to victory to victory. How do I know? Because we've been on the banks of Jordan and God has shown up every time. What to do when a river runs through? Three things from Joshua 3. Follow God on the ground, number one. Number two, when a river runs through, consecrate yourself. When a river runs through, consecrate yourself. One thing that I've learned on the banks of Jordan is that behind natural problems, there are spiritual dynamics at work. You see, God works in the mysterious ways that he does, often because he's trying to do something inside of us. The trigger to our miracle that we've been waiting on is a change of heart or a change of thinking or a change of behavior that God is trying to bring about in us. On the banks of Jordan, Joshua tells the children of Israel to consecrate themselves for three days. It's the same command that Moses gave at the foot of Sinai in Exodus 19. We were just there last week, and most commentators agree that it entailed the same orders. Take a bath, wash your clothes, and abstain from marital intimacy for three days. What can we learn from that? Well, if there's a river running through your life right now, standing between you and God's promises I want you to ask yourself two questions. First of all, is there something in my life that needs to be cleansed? Joshua told the people, take a bath, wash your clothes. They were God's covenant people. They were saved by his covenant of grace. They were preserved by his loyal, faithful love, but they needed a bath. And Jesus said, sometimes we need the same. In the upper room, Jesus told the disciples, if you've been cleaned, your whole body is clean, but your feet might need a little touch-up. You see, when we've believed on Jesus, when we've received him into our hearts, our bodies are clean, metaphorically speaking. The moment that we believe on Jesus and his cross, our sins are washed away from us, and we receive his white robe of righteousness. We don't ever have to go through that experience again, but our feet might need a little touch-up. In a moment of weakness, have we fumbled? If we've neglected our relationship with the Lord, have we fallen back into some old patterns of thinking or speaking or behaving? 
Is there anything that we need to confess to the Lord and receive his cleansing? John wrote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and, and to, I'm sorry, and to, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That that word consecrate in Hebrew is an interesting word. It comes from two roots. That means to cut away and to burn bright. The picture is trimming a wick on a lamp or on a candle so that after you trim the wick, the flame can burn brighter. Before God showed off in front of Jericho, before God showed off in front of the Canaanites, he wanted to make sure his people were, were cut clean and burning brightly for him. Two questions. If there's a river running through your life, is there anything in my life that needs to be cleansed? And is there anything in my life that needs to be surrendered? Beloved, sometimes there are things in our lives that are not sinful in themselves, but if we put them away, uh, if we put them ahead of the Lord, they need to be surrendered. Talked about it last week. God told the married couples to abstain from intimacy for three days. Now the word of God is clear that married couples are free to enjoy themselves as much as they want, whenever they want. It's their God-given right. But God said, surrender for three days. Just as a reminder that I am God and you are not. Beloved, sometimes the key to crossing our river is something that God wants us to surrender to his lordship. Maybe it's something we take pride in. Maybe it's something that gives us a sense of identity or something that gives us a sense of security. And God says, I want you to surrender that and trust in me. In 2007... My mom came to the conclusion that she needed to sell the family home that I grew up in. It was a four-bedroom, three-and-a-half bathroom house. Had a ballet studio in it, a built-in pool in the backyard, and it was just way too big and too expensive for my mom to maintain anymore. She listed the house, and right after she listed it, the real estate bubble burst. Do you remember that back in 2007? Mom's house sat on the market for the next two years. There were at least five other houses on our street that were all similar that were for sale. And in the neighborhood, there were dozens of houses. They were all built by the same developer at the same time. In 1960, they, they were all identical, all for sale. My mom dropped her price four times and didn't have a single bite. The realtor said, drop it again. And, and my mom said, if I drop it again, there's going to be nothing left. She came up here for a visit, and the Lord gave one of our intercessors a word, T.T. Edna. Said, Ginny, I feel like the reason that your house hasn't sold is spiritual. I feel like it hasn't sold because you haven't let go of it. Now listen, that would have been a word that would be very easy to dismiss, no, the reason my house hasn't sold is because the entire country is in an economic meltdown and there are dozens of identical houses on the market right now and everything's frozen. That's why it hasn't sold. But my mom took the word to heart. She went home and she prayed on it. You know, in 70 years, my mom had only ever lived in two houses. She lived in her parents' house and when she married my father, they moved directly into the house where I grew up. When my parents got divorced in the 1980s, my mom's lawyer said to her, you will never get the house. And my mom said, yes, I will, because Jesus promised it to me. My mom's prayer was that with all of the upheaval created by the divorce, her prayer was that my sisters and I wouldn't have to move out of our family home, that she could at least give us that stability of staying in the same house and the same schools and the same friends. And her business was in the house and she used the, the proceeds from the business to send us to Christian school. To the lawyer's dismay, my father gave my mom the house free and clear in the divorce. So the house represented security to my mom. It, it was a blessing from the Lord. It was her nest. She loved it and she really didn't want to let it go. But after that word from the Lord, my mom went home and she got down on her knees 
and she had communion. And she prayed, Lord, ever since I met you, you have been my source of provision. You have been my protector. You have been my guide. And wherever I go, I will be home as long as you are with me. Then my mom got up and she put on worship music like she always played all through our house, all growing up from the time we knew the Lord. Somebody listen because there's keys in here for you. You listening? There's keys in here for you. My mom played worship music continually in our house. And she put on worship music and she took a white handkerchief, Teresa, and she walked through every room of her house waving that white handkerchief, surrendering the house to the Lord. Somebody listen to me. There's a word, something you're trying to sell. You listen to me. The next day, the next day, the next day, the realtor called my mom and she said, Ginny, there are two buyers who are interested in the house. This was after two years without a single bite and the two buyers got into a bidding war with each other. Now, beloved, listen to me. Here in Greenwich, in, in Fairfield County, in Westchester County, when the market's hot, bidding wars are not uncommon. It never happens in the suburbs of Philly, not where I am from. It is unheard of. Two buyers got, and in that market, two buyers got in a bidding war, and they drove the house back up to the original asking price, and my mom sold the house for the original asking Don't you tell me that God is limited by the economy to do great things on behalf of his people. God marches to a completely different economy. His economy never contracts. It never has a recession of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. <laughs> to add to the story, on the day that my mom listed her house for sale, she noticed a little house just around the corner for rent. The little, darling little dollhouse built in 1830, little quaint antique cottage. And she saw on the day she listed her house, she saw a for rent sign and the thought went through her mind, maybe I can live there. The house sat on the market for two years and the for rent sign came down and she kind of forgot all about it until the day came to sign contracts on the sale of her house. And on the way back from the lawyer, she went by that little dollhouse and the for rent sign was up. She called the landlord and she went and met with him. And he said to her, you know, it's the funniest thing. He said, two years ago, somebody rented this house and they never moved in. He said, they paid me rent for two years. And just yesterday, they called me and said, we're not going to move into the house. He said, I just put the sign up this morning and yours was the first call that I got. My mom lived in that little dollhouse, the, the sweet little man and woman that owned it. Uh, they, we went to church with them. They were avid gardeners, and my mom loved gardening, so she had beautiful gardens, and she enjoyed them until this spring. And over the winter, this last winter, my mom decided that by June she was going to have to make another move because her money, she lived as frugally as she could, but the money just dwindled down, and she decided after June she just wouldn't be able to stay there anymore. She was determined that she was going to have to talk with my sisters and I to figure out what to do next. And in March, she got a letter from her landlord saying that he had listed the little dollhouse on the market. He had put it up on the market. Two days later, she got another letter. There's a spirit-filled Mennonite church in our area, a large church. And they have a beautiful retirement community that is subsidized by the giving of the congregation. They have beautiful seniors' apartments. And two or three years ago, one of my mom's friends said, Ginny, you know, you ought to put your name in at, at that place. Put your name on the waiting list. And so in March, my mom decided by June I have to do something. I'm not going to have enough money to stay here. In March, she gets a letter that her house is listed, the rental house is listed. And two days later, she gets a letter from the retirement community that her name's getting close to the top of the list. 
So she goes for an interview, and they said, Ginny, they said, it, 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 we don't know. You're, you're three or four people from the top. It could be six months. It could be a year. You know, I want to put this delicately, but in order for an apartment to open up, somebody has to get promoted to glory, and, and we never know when that's going to take. So said, it could be six months or a year, but let's get the paperwork together. Well, it didn't take six months. It took six weeks. And on May 31st, my mom was settled in her beautiful new apartment when she said, by June, I have to do something. Beloved, you know why that happened? That happened because since the time my mom became a believer in 1974, she was always faithful to the tithe. She was always faithful to give to the Lord, and she gave offerings as well. She helped build two churches in Philly. She helped build phase one. She's given offerings to build phase two. Listen to me. If you want to be blessed in your buying and in your selling, be faithful to the tithe. If you want to be blessed in your retirement, be faithful in your giving to the Lord. But here's the point of the story. For mom, the key to crossing the river was spiritual. It was something she had to surrender to the Lord. And maybe that's our key too. Some of you know that I went to a very old-fashioned Pentecostal Bible school. It's not really the, the environment I was raised in. I was raised charismatic. How on earth I ended up with these old Pentecostals, only the Lord knows. He does know. Well, the school ran on an old faith paradigm. They didn't charge any tuition. Students, we all worked and we ran the campus and we prayed for God to provide our daily needs. And we saw God do miracle after miracle after miracle. But if ever there was a time that the provision stopped flowing, our Bible school president's wife would get up and she would say, perhaps there's something that needs to be cleansed or there's something that needs to be surrendered. And we would go to the Lord in the words of David, search me, O God, and know my heart and test my thoughts and examine my ways. See if there be any wicked thing in me. In 21 years here at Harvest Time, there has never been a time when the provision hasn't come when we needed it until now. What we need in our general fund hasn't come in. There's a shortfall. What we need in our building to finish the building hasn't come in. We have come to the Jordan and it's flooded. And maybe the key to our breakthrough is spiritual. I want you to enjoy your Thanksgiving dinner. I want you to eat all the turkey your heart delights. Nick's preaching next week so he can deal with you in your turkey coma next weekend. But after Thanksgiving, I want you to do something with me. From December 1st to the 10th, I'm calling a congregational fast. Now, I'm not asking you to fast for 10 days unless the Lord leads you to do that. But here's what I want you to do. During that 10-day period from December 1st to December 10th, I want to ask you to make some expression of fasting for three days. It's going to be a fast of consecration like the children of Israel did on the banks of Jordan. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do during that fast of consecration, that three days, making some expression of fasting, I'm going to ask you to invite the Lord to search you and to know your heart and your thoughts and your ways and see if there's anything that needs to be cleansed or anything that needs to be surrendered. And then would you pray with us that God will release to us what we need. What to do when a river runs through. Three things from Joshua 3. Number one, follow God on the ground. Number two, consecrate yourself. And finally, number three, go stand in the river. Joshua told the priests who were carrying the ark, when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go stand in the river. I want you to think about that with me. How many of you have ever tried to cross a river? How many of you have ever walked in a river, even a slow-moving river of just three to four miles an hour is enough to knock you off balance. And then there's those slimy river rocks. Last year, we took the kids to Yellowstone Park. 
And we took them swimming in a boiling river. There's a, a mountain river in the park. It's cold water coming down out of the mountains. But along the way, there are geothermal vents that pour hot water from underneath the surface. And it makes natural hot tubs in the river. It is the coolest thing ever. You get in the river, it's freezing cold. And then you find these natural pockets I walked, I said, come on kids, we're going to go swimming in the boiling river. I got in the river, I walked three steps and fell right on my backside. My flip-flops flew off my feet, they went floating down the river, my hat went down the river, my sunglasses went down the river. It's hard to walk in a river under the best of circumstances. But Jordan was flooded and God said, go stand in the river. Beloved, listen to me. In the life of faith, there comes a moment when you have to trust God and you have to get into the river with both feet. There comes a moment when you have to take a big risk. There comes a moment when you have to swing your leg out over the bow of the boat and let your feet touch the top of, Gal of, jo of Galilee. There comes a moment when you have to let your feet get wet. There comes a moment when you have to take a step and dare to believe that God is going to show up and do something you have never seen Him do before. In 1998, we stood in the river and we signed the contract to buy this land. I was 30 years old. In 2000, we stood in the river and we broke ground on this building. In 2008, we stood in the river and we applied for zoning for phase two. In 2014, we stood in the river and we broke ground on phase two. We didn't have enough money to build this building, but we had to start or lose our zoning approvals. We have been on the banks of Jordan again and again and again. And I don't find it gets easier to step in. I find it gets harder. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant reached the banks of the river. And when they stepped in, the waters just dissipated right under their feet and ran away. I want to tell you three things and we're done. Three observations and we're done. First, go stand in the river because your miracle has already been released and it is already on the way to you. The Bible says that the waters of the Jordan stopped flowing about 20 miles upstream at a town called Adam. On a normal day, the Jordan flowed at about three or four miles an hour. At flood time, maybe it was double that, about 10 miles an hour. But in order for the water to dissipate when the priest set foot into the river, that means that it actually had to stop flowing two hours earlier up in the town of Adam. You see, while the priests were making their way to Jordan before they ever even got to the bank, the miracle had already been released. The miracle was already coming down the river towards them. The miracle was already coming at them. And in the perfect timing of God, when they took a step of faith, the waters disappeared from underneath their feet. Beloved, I feel that God has a word for somebody in this place today. You've been praying. You've been asking God. You've been seeking Him. You've been imploring Him. I want to tell you in Jesus' name that your miracle has already been released. And it is already coming down the river towards you. God's waiting for that moment when you make your step of faith and go stand in the, in the river. And the water's going to disappear from underneath your feet. Three observations and we're done. Go stand in the river. Your miracle's already on the way. Go stand in the river and God will stand between you and the river. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into Jordan and the water dissipated underneath their feet. And when they reached the middle of the river, they stopped and they stood still with the Ark on their shoulders. The waters 
piled up for miles upstream. I don't know how high that pile of water was, but I can tell you, it was a lot of water. It was a mountain. It was a big tidal wave standing still. So here, I want you to get the visual. The children of Israel cross a good distance away from the Ark of the Covenant. And so as they're crossing, they're looking, and in the distance, they see the Ark, and behind the Ark, they see the river piled up, a big curtain of water. Yesterday, the river stood between them and God's promises. But today, when they stepped into the river, God stood between them and the river. <laughs> Beloved, there's a word for somebody. The things that are standing between you and success, the things that are standing between you and blessings, the blessing, the people that are standing between you and peace, God is going to move between you and those things. God is going to block whatever and whomever is blocking you. God is going to hold back whatever and whoever is holding you back. God is going to stop whatever or whoever is stopping you. Go ahead, step in the river, and God will stand between you and the river. And there really is no choice, is there? You know, the cloud and the pillar was gone. The manna was gone. The rock that poured out water in the wilderness, it was all gone. There really was no choice. There was no going back to Egypt. There was only going forward following the ark. Beloved, can I tell you, there's no going back now on phase two. There's only one way for us from here, and it's forward into the new building. There's no going back to, to when this building wasn't here. There's no going back to when it was just phase one. There's no going back to the air dome. We can't get it back. It's gone. And we can't undo that. There's only one way, and that is forward following the ark. Three observations, and we're done. Get in the river. Your miracle is already on the way. Get in the river and God will stand between you and the river. And finally, get in the river because once you cross, you will never be the same. I have to tell you the truth. If I could have avoided the river, I would have. Would I want to go through it again? Absolutely not. But I want to tell you, I've been to the banks of the Jordan. And every time God has met me, and I will never be the same. Israel was crossing over into a whole new way of life. They had been nomads for seven, almost 800 years from the time God called Abraham. They were nomads. When they crossed the river, they were nomads, no mo. They crossed the river into a new life of abundance, into a new life of fruitfulness, into a new life of peace, into a new life of settledness. Beloved, can I tell you, you listen to me, we're not just some group moving into a new building. We're God's people, and we're crossing over into a new place of abundance, into a new place of blessedness, into a new place of settledness. God closed the door after the priest's when the priest's feet left the riverbed, the waters returned right back to flood stage. There was no going back. There was only going forward. Go ahead and stand in the river because when God brings you across, you will never be the same. Why does God do the mysterious things he does? Why does he work the way that he does? It's so that we'll know that he is with us and that he will surely give us victory and we will never be the same. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a good praise.